Welcome to the award-winning Thoughts from a Page podcast, a member of the Evergreen Podcasts Network, hosted by me, Cindy Burnett, a voracious reader and book columnist who provides you with casual author conversations, book recommendation episodes, and insider information on all of the newest releases that I have read and endorse, and on the publishing industry in my Behind the Scenes series. With so many books coming out weekly, it can be hard to decide what to read, so I find the best ones and share them with you. For more book recommendations or to find my backlist of interviews, visit my website at thoughtsfromapage.com. In 2023, I have a new segment on my Tuesday episodes called Read Alike Requests. Listeners can submit a book they loved and tell me why they loved it, and I will suggest some similar reads. There is a Google form included in today's show notes if you would like to send in a request. If you love to read, I hope you'll consider joining my Patreon group to access additional content, including bonus episodes and early reads with prepub author chats. For March, there are two books, Colleen Oakley's new book, The Mostly True Story of Tanner and Louise, and Fifth Avenue Glamour Girl by Renee Rosen. And for April, my selection is The Comeback Summer by writing duo Allie Brady. The link to join is in the show notes. Today, I am chatting with Shelley Reed about Go as a River. Shelley is a fifth-generation Coloradoan who lives with her family in the Elk Mountains of the Western Slope. She was a senior lecturer at Western Colorado University for nearly three decades, where she taught writing, literature, and environmental studies. Go as a River is her debut novel. I hope you enjoy our conversation. And now for a quick break. For the last year, I have been focusing more on my health and eating habits. In connection with that, I have started drinking AG1 in the morning. When I started drinking AG1 daily, I could feel a real difference in my health and energy levels. That is because AG1 is a foundational nutrition supplement that supports your body's universal needs like gut optimization, stress management, and immune support. Since 2010, AG1 has led the future of foundational nutrition, continuously refining their formula to create a smarter, better way to elevate your baseline health. I recommend AG1 to all of my family and friends because the company has a team of doctors and scientists, it is tested for 950 contaminants, and is NSF certified for sport, it is formulated based on the latest science, and it maintains high quality standards. Thanks AG1 for sponsoring my show. AG1 is a supplement I trust to provide the support my body needs daily. If you want to take ownership of your health, it starts with AG1. Try AG1 and get a free one-year supply of vitamin D3K2 and five free AG1 travel packs with your first purchase. Go to drinkag1.com slash thoughts from a page. That's drinkag, the number one, dot com slash thoughts from a page. Check it out. And now back to my show. And now for my read-alike request segment. While every book is unique and stands alone, certain elements of books we love really stick with us. While lots of websites use algorithms to try and recommend similar books, I rarely find that these recommendations make sense because they do not focus on what it is I liked about a particular book. That is what I want to tap into, the aspects of the book that appeal to the requester and to focus on finding those elements in other books. Today's request is from Heather, who is at Lit Chick Forever on Facebook and Twitter, and she selected Looking for Jane by Heather Marshall. Looking for Jane is a debut about three women whose lives are bound together by a long-lost letter, a mother's love, and a secret network of women fighting for the right to choose, and it is inspired by true stories. Heather enjoyed the book because she liked the alternate timelines, multiple narrators, and the interconnected stories that all come together. I have not read Looking for Jane, which just recently published, but I love multiple timeline stories that are told through numerous narrators as well, so it was really fun to find some read-alikes for Heather. My first recommendation is The Lost Letter by Jillian Cantor, which is one of the best examples that I have ever read of interconnected stories weaving together very well. The book focuses on an Austrian master stamp engraver who works for the resistance during World War II and a mysterious love letter that connects generations of Jewish families. It is a dual timeline narrative, something that appeals to Heather, which is set in 1939 Australia and 1989 Los Angeles. And as I mentioned above, the two tales interconnect beautifully. It remains one of my top historical fiction recommendations to readers, and I think it is a great read-alike for looking for Jane. My next recommendation is Our Woman in Moscow by Beatrice Williams, which is my favorite of her books. When the Digby family disappears from their London home without a trace in the fall of 1948, the world debates whether they were eliminated by Soviet intelligence or whether the family defected to Moscow with American diplomat Sasha Digby's access to the West's top secret intel. Four years later, Ruth McAllister receives a letter from twin sister Iris Digby, 
asking her to come to Moscow to visit. While the timelines are not separated by many years, this is an absolutely fascinating glimpse at the start of the Cold War, and Iris and Ruth each narrate their own story. A Woman in Moscow contains all three of the factors that Heather liked in Looking for Jane. The last book I am recommending as a read-alike for Looking for Jane is Homecoming by Kate Morton, which comes out this coming April. It is a dual-timeline historical mystery set in Australia in 1969 and 2018, and is the story of three women and their tie to a shocking true crime of the past. In this story, there is also a book within a book allowing the story to unfold in a unique manner and adding to the suspense of the story. This is a great read-alike for Looking for Jane because the two timelines ultimately weave together flawlessly, and it is such a compelling story with some great twists and turns that I did not see coming. I want to quickly mention one more book, which is Sadiqwa Johnson's new book, The House of Eve. It is a great read-alike for Looking for Jane, subject matter-wise, something that Heather had not mentioned, but I thought I would still include. Thanks, Heather, for submitting a read-alike request, and I hope you enjoy these recommendations. And now, on to my conversation with Shelley Reed. Welcome, Shelley. How are you today? Oh, I'm so good, Cindy. I'm so happy to be with you today. I am so glad you're here because I just adored your book. I sat in on a Spiegel and Grau event in the fall that you participated in, and Mary Weber O'Malley was on the same event, and she texted me, you must read this book next. You must drop everything else you're reading and read this. And I did, and I am so glad I did because it's just phenomenal. Oh my goodness. That's just amazing. Thank you. Thank you for that. Absolutely. And really what I love so much about it, it is a beautiful, beautiful story, both your prose and the story. I mean, it's just kind of the perfect combination and it's been sold in over 32 territories already. I mean, can you even believe it? No, no. I have been so incredibly blown away every step of the, of the way. You know, I, I began this novel a long time ago, which we can talk about, and I didn't even have necessarily the intention. Well, I certainly didn't have the intention of any of this happening on such a scale. I was going to be so grateful to just finish it and get it in the world at all. And then all of this momentum and love has happened around it. And it's just been so moving and so unanticipated and so glorious <laughs> for me. I never imagined in a million years that this would happen. But I do love Victoria and I do love her story. So I'm just so thrilled that readers everywhere are connecting with it. It's incredible. It is incredible. And I just can't remember the last time there was this much pre-pub buzz from all the different bookstagrammers that I chat with and other people. So I'm just so excited for it to be out in the world, and I know you are too, and I look forward to talking about Victoria. But before we do that, will you give me a quick synopsis of Go as a River for those that won't have read it yet? Sure, yeah. The quick synopsis is it's the story of a young woman named Victoria Nash growing up on the banks of the wild Gunnison River on the western slope of the Colorado Rockies. And the book opens in 1948, and it carries through Victoria's point of view to 1971. And in that time span, we learn so much about Victoria as a vulnerable human being who must face a variety of challenges. She, when the novel opens, she has no idea who she is or how strong she is. And through a variety of tragedies and challenges and difficulties and very difficult decisions, she, we really see her discover herself and her own strength and resilience. And she doesn't even really have any role models. So she is really having to do so much of that on her own. Yes. Yes. She's a very solitary character in a lot of ways. Uh, as the book opens, we learn relatively quickly that her mother and her aunt and her cousin, who are all very important to her, had died when she was 12 years old in a car accident. And she is growing up a motherless, but also the only female in a house full of men, of very difficult men. And she immediately, as a young, as a, as a girl, stepped into the domestic role that her mother had played for those men and in that home and on the farm that they live on and in the orchard, the peach orchard, which is a generational treasure to her family. So really, her roles are completely defined for her from a very young age. And she really is a very obedient and good person who steps into every day doing what she thinks needs to be done. And in that way, she really gives herself away 
and has no idea who she is outside of the context of her domestic role for the men in her life. Well, I would love to hear how you came up with the idea for this one, and I'd also love to know if Victoria is inspired by anyone. Oh, okay. Well, I actually do have a a fun, a, a kind of a cool story of where this novel began for me as a writer. And it's not at all where the novel begins for the reader. But um, somewhere around page 120-ish in the novel, um, there's a scene of the uh, Victoria's out in a meadow and a mother deer, a, a, a doe, comes shuffling out of the foliage into the same meadow where Victoria is sitting. And they sort of lock eyes in a very powerful way. And then shuffle, shuffle, comes out one fawn behind this mother deer and then shuffle, shuffle, another, a second fawn who's smaller than the first. And that exact scene, almost exactly as I describe it in my book, happened to me one evening when I was out camping alone in the Upper East River Valley, which is one of the highest valleys in the Gunnison, in, in Gunnison County and in the Gunnison River Valley. That exact scene happened to me, and it was so beautiful, and it was so moving. And I remember connecting just eye to eye with that deer, thinking, you know, mother to mother thinking, how are you going to keep both of those babies alive? You know, just, I was just so moved mother to mother. And there was something in that moment that was so powerful for me. So the deer moved on, went on to the river or whatever they were doing. And I I rushed and grabbed my journal out of my tent and I sat and I wrote and I wrote and I wrote and I wrote that scene down. And the next morning I got up early, I was climbing a mountain, which I love to climb and camp by myself. It's really I spend a tremendous amount of time in the wilderness, and it's really just where all of life makes most sense to me. It's where I do my clearest thinking, and it's where I feel safest. And anyway, so I was climbing a mountain, and I was really thinking about that moment with the deer. And somehow, for some reason, I started thinking about that moment through the lens of someone who wasn't me. And and I think that's the moment that the character of Victoria was born. I started thinking, who is this observer? Who is this person? I knew right away it had something to do with the female connection that I felt with the deer. But there, were, that's where the, the seed for this entire novel was planted. And really, it just grew from there in, in very non sequitur, almost wacky ways over a lo- many, many years as I got to know Victoria better and better. And I started conceiving who she is and what her journey would be. I love that story. Uh, Yeah, I'm I'm actually really grateful. I remember it with such clarity as the moment that this story began, because a lot of the writing of this book is a little bit of a blur to me, because I actually just fit it in sort of whenever I could. uh, I was a full-time professor. I was teaching full-time at my university, loving my students, being super dedicated to their success. I was a very dedicated mom to my two kids who I absolutely adore and just tried to give them everything I had. And there wasn't a lot of room for creative thinking. And yet the story and Victoria and who is she and all of it, just it would not leave me. It was on my mind all the time. But I just, I think because there are only so many hours in the day, I had to really chip away at it little by little by little. Well, and sometimes those are the best ways to do it because if it doesn't all come in a rush, but it comes piecemeal, then it's slowly getting put together. And that's what creates this beautiful story is just having the time for it to percolate. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, while the story was percolating, I was growing in that decade or so that I was envisioning this book and thinking about it a lot. I went through a lot of, you know, difficult times and tough decisions and tragedies and losses and grief. And I was becoming as Victoria was becoming, honestly. And I, and I think that that informed the novel in ways that I never could have anticipated. And I think it brought a lot of richness to the narrative. And so really, when I look back on the process of it, I actually wouldn't change a thing. I do think grief is one of those things that you can write about it if you haven't experienced it. But unless you have experienced it in some detail, someone close it's really hard to understand exactly what those emotions are and how up and down it is and how it's going to feel day to day. And so I think until you have experienced it, it's not going to be nearly as authentic on the page. Yeah, I I do think that's true. And, you know, Victoria has, is carrying grief from the minute we meet her at the um, first page of the book with the loss of her family. And so 
you know, she's already been affected by that, but in ways that she is not equipped at that young age to understand or process. And as you said earlier, she certainly was getting no guidance from anyone. And so, you know, I I hope many readers connect with her in that way right away, because what I often say about the, the themes of grief and loss in this book are pretty much every human on some level, sometimes very intense levels, sometimes quieter levels, but pretty much every human, if if you're not carrying grief at some point, of course you will. And so to me, it's the one of the most deep and common of human experiences. And it would be a beautiful, beautiful thing if we could all connect with one another on that way, in that way, like look one another in the eye and say, I carry grief, you carry grief, I see and feel that in you. And, and I connect with you in, in that way. And I am wondering if, if that's part of the power that this book is having for some readers, is to see their own grief and their own grief journeys uh, reflected back at them. That's such an interesting point, because I've had a fair amount of loss in the last couple of years. And that may be additionally why it was resonating with me, because I'm like, oh, I understand all of these feelings. And Shelley clearly understands all of these feelings as she's writing about them. Yeah, I I hope so. You know, I hope so. I I think that, you know, thematically the book evolved to have layers. You know, I think there are layers and layers of thematic concerns in in Go as a River. I've been told that people are really excited for for book clubs for that reason because there's a lot to unpack here. You can read it, I think, on a variety of levels. I I've been told that it's a it's a nice page turner, which is really exciting for me because it's not necessarily I guess that wasn't my entirely my intention, and yet story matters to me so much. And I, all the choices that I made as a writer for this entire narrative, I was very, very clear that story is is what matters the most. And so, in that way, I'm glad that it's a story that compels people to want to turn the page and find out what's happening next. Um, but I think the most meaningful for me about the book are the the layers of of thematic concerns. That I really, I really thought through very deeply, and uh, they're the things that 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 I think about and that I ponder in my own existence. And things like grief and loss, and also the female experience in the world, and how women are so often defined by their circumstances or by their culture. And it takes a lot of strength and resilience to stand up for something different. The thematic concerns around home and place and displacement. Are concerns in my own life. And uh, as has been written about me, I'm a fifth generation Colorado native. So I have a sense of home deep inside my bones and a sense of homeland. And then also the wilderness and wild landscapes and the deep lessons that the wilderness can teach us. These are in family, family and home and, and, and where do we turn when these things are lost? These are really the, the major concerns that I carry in my own heart. And so it, it makes sense that those end up being the major concerns of the book. But I think there's a lot for readers to engage with and a lot to examine in Victoria's experience. I agree. And I think it will make a great book club book. And that was actually one of my questions for you about the themes, because as I was thinking about the book and coming up with a list of questions, one of the things I really wanted to talk about were some of the themes, displacement, the effects of war, being a woman in a male-oriented society, racism, finding home, so many of the things you've already mentioned. And I think that is probably what is also resonating because there are a lot of important aspects and themes and other things being discussed, but it's all woven very seamlessly into your story. Great. Good. I'm really glad to hear that because, like I said, to me, the story is, is the primary concern. And I think anything, any detail, any concern that runs through the book needs to be in service of the story. So I I do hope that all of that feels organic. I definitely did not set out with any of it to teach a lesson or to to include a particular commentary on, on any of those themes. I just sort of wanted to put them out there as some of the depth of human experience. And I'm glad that it enhanced the novel and also that it seems organic to the to the plot and to the story itself. Very organic. The other thing that I wanted to chat about was that the events that you describe about the town of Iola and how it was submerged to create a dam really happened. It's so sad to think about a hometown being destroyed in that manner. And I love this sentence from your prologue. If this makes you wonder whether the joys and pains of a place 
wash away as the floodwaters rise and swallow. I can tell you they do not. And I think that really ties in with what you were just talking about, a fifth generation Colorado and hometown, you know, that sense of place and tied to a land. And I just, so many sentences in your book are highlighted for me and I love them. But I thought that one really made me think. And I'd like to talk a little bit about Iola and what happened. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, I've spent most of my life in the Gunnison Valley. I I didn't grow up here, but I had family here. And then just, and I loved it. It's just been my favorite place in the world my entire life. And so as soon as I was able to choose where I wanted to live, when I went to college, I spent summers here. And then I got a job teaching at Western Colorado University fresh out of grad school. And I've been here ever since. So that's 30 plus years, 30, I don't know, 33 years or so. And ever since I was a child, I knew that there was a town beneath Blue Mesa Reservoir. There are three towns actually under Blue Mesa Reservoir, but Iola was the one that really captured my imagination. And Blue Mesa Reservoir is the largest reservoir in Colorado. And it's where everybody in my valley goes to swim and fish and boat. And I think that it's very easy to, to recreate and to play in, the, in Blue Mesa Reservoir without asking, you know, what's the story here? The, it, generations of ranchers and farmers who had really had a love, a deep love and connection to that land were displaced in order for that reservoir to be built. And so I, I just always was very compelled by what's the story here. So, you know, I did my research. I, I looked more deeply into the town of Iola, what life was like there, what were the circumstances of the evacuation of the people and the drowning of the town. And in doing that research, I just, it was so moving to me, all that the people had lost. But then, of course, I could not write a book about displacement in the American West and displacement in the Gunnison River Valley without also acknowledging that previous to the white settlers and farmers and ranchers that deeply connected and loved that land, the indigenous population of what is the Gunnison Valley were the Ute people who were so violently displaced from that exact land previous to the white settlers. And so there's layers and layers of painful history around displacement in the area where the town of Iola once stood all underneath Blue Mesa Reservoir now, all in the name of quote unquote progress. And I thought that those themes were really, were really rich to, to investigate. And thus the character of Wilson Moon was born. And we can talk about Will, but I, Will for me was a character that I, I developed very, very carefully because whereas I wanted the indigenous experience to be represented in my book, I also felt on some level, it, Will's story was not my story to tell. And so I leave him a little bit mysterious, but I also tell his story through Victoria's lens. And I also try to create two characters, young Victoria, young Wilson Moon, who just connect with each other heart to heart, transcendent of all of the cultural biases that either one of them could have inherited about each other. And they simply don't let that inform how they feel. And I liked the contrast that Wilson did not believe that one place was different from another because of his experience and, you know, being shuttled around versus Victoria, who says, oh, gosh, like this is the greatest place ever. And it's very different than other places. And I thought that was an interesting contrast. Yeah, I tried to represent Will as sort of a, a common, tragic story of displaced people. Also, the added tragedy for the character of Will is he is the character that I don't go into it too much, but it tells a story that really, really mattered to me to tell, which is the horrific practice in the 19th and 20th century of stealing indigenous children from their families and putting them in these awful, what they called Indian boarding schools, which were these horrific schools that were meant to turn indigenous children into sort of basically good little white kids. And so the backstory on Will that's only alluded to a couple times was that he was stolen from his family from the reservation, placed in one of these horrific schools, and he, and he then escaped from that. So Will then becomes a character who's, so, who's too, quote unquote, white to go back to his reservation, but also too you know, indigenous to fit into the white world. And so Will is a drifter, but a drifter with a lot of backstory and a lot of complicated 
cultural biases informing that. And then the racism and prejudice that informs just his existence becomes primary in the book. Whereas Victoria is very, very rooted to one place. She actually can't imagine life outside of her own homeland in Iola. And I try to set up that contrast immediately and how the displacement plays out very differently for these two characters. Yes. And I thought that was just really interesting, the contrast in the two and their backstories. I mean, and why there is the contrast. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Their, Their two experiences couldn't be the same. They're both victims of displacement, but from different eras and different cultural biases. And their, yeah, their stories couldn't play out the same. And just the crazy racism that poor Wilson experiences. I mean, you know, the woman who runs the boarding house and doesn't know him at all, but automatically attributes all of these characteristics to him. It's just so horrifying. You just wish people would take the time to get to know people. Yeah. And yet that's just historically not how we generally have have been able to to see and treat one another in, uh, well, you know, throughout human history. But if we're talking about specifically about the development of, of the Western United States, you know, racism and prejudice is is so rooted in ignorance. It's so rooted in assumptions and stereotypes. And it's very rarely um, do we give one another the chance of just learning who, who we are human to human. And I tried very hard in the book to not represent. It was very important to me to not represent all of the people of Iola as, as racist or prejudiced, because that would not be an accurate representation of the people of Iola. I think the people of Iola were generally just good, hardworking people who were people of their moment and of their time. It was really just a handful of bad apples of cruel, narrow-minded people in the town who wouldn't accept Will. And I think the general population, you know, there's a moment in the novel where Victoria wonders who who would have stood up for Will had they been given the chance. And um, and she says, you know, probably most. And so I try to to layer complexities. I think the bias and prejudice and racism is so deeply complex. I didn't want to oversimplify, and I certainly didn't want to represent the, misrepresent the people of Iola. But I did want to say that in any given town at that era, and unfortunately, maybe still today, but certainly of that era, clearly there were going to be racists who did not give Will um, the opportunity to show what a gentle and wonderful and kind person he was. Absolutely. I was just going to say, it's not just limited to that time period, unfortunately. But I think that's exactly right. I think you go anywhere in the United States, any group of people, and you're going to see a wide range of opinions. And I think that's something that's really come to the forefront in the last four or five, six years with all the political drama and, you know, just trying to understand how people feel about different things. I definitely feel like all of Viola was not racist. You're going to have certain people like that, sadly, wherever you go. But it's just always so painful when you see it or hear about it. I just don't understand it. But I think it's, it is representative. And I think you're just not always going to have some of those people. Yeah, and, and so painful. And I try not to shy away from the horrors of it, from the tragedy of it. And also, you know, show Will and Victoria as another answer. You know, we can, we can look through the lens of bias and vitriol and hate and anger and stereotype, or we can come together human heart to human heart. And both of those are included in, in my story. Absolutely. Well, the other thing that I really loved about your story was the strong sense of place. So you really connect the reader with nature and the area of Colorado where the book is set. Did you have to work to do that or was that just a part of your writing? Oh, that was absolutely the most natural and easy part of writing this book, actually, because like I said, I spend a tremendous amount of time uh, in wild landscapes. I'm lucky enough to be surrounded by them where I live in the upper end of the of the Gunnison Valley. I live every day of my life at 9,000 feet elevation. And Gunnison County is 90% public lands, a wonderful combination of BLM, national forest, wilderness areas. It's all around. And since I was a child, being in wild landscapes has taught me, sometimes I feel like it's taught me everything I know. <laughs> it's taught me the most important things. I'm also a big mountain climber. I I love to climb big peaks. We have uh, 54, 14,000 foot peaks here in Colorado. I've climbed m- most of them. I, I've lost track of how many at this point, but, and I do it not in any level to quote unquote conquer the mountain or 
anything ridiculous like that. I just seek out experiences where I can participate in some small way with this grandeur that is so much larger and more eternal than myself and my own little moment of existence. And in that way, I find a lot of a lot of lessons, a lot of spirituality, and, and a lot of meaning. And so it's what I when I, I always take a journal with me when I'm out hiking and climbing and camping and backpacking. And I've written volumes of my observations of the natural world. It's always really fascinating to me that I think poets and writers and biologists sort of <laughs> attend to the natural world in a similar way. And that is in the minutia, you know, I've always, I've long had a very keen eye to the details of the natural world. And uh, that part of this novel was the greatest joy for me to write. And it was also really wonderful to lead Victoria toward a path where she began tuning in more carefully to those details and those lessons as well. So we go to Estes Park every summer to Rocky Mountain National Park. Yeah. And you mentioned the 14ers and I have a 17-year-old son and his goal this summer is to climb Long's Peak because we always do a lot of hiking when we're up there. And so he has wanted to do that for a long time. And I said, until you're a little bit older, since we're not living in Colorado, you know, we come and go, let's wait till you're a little bit older. But that is his goal for the summer. He's been training. He's super excited because we just are the same way. Like, it's just beautiful to be outside and you get to the top of any of those mountains. I've not done a 14er, but, you know, some of the others, and it's just so peaceful. And you could just sit up there forever looking around and enjoying the view and the beauty of the world. Yeah, it's it's instant perspective. It, for me, it's incredibly instructive. It's um, whatever small concerns of your day, of you know whatever it is, it's instant perspective. That that geological time, it, it there's a wisdom to it that immediately picks me up from whatever you know ragged place I'm in and sets me on a healing path or sets me on a on a perspective that is going to ground me again. And um, I hope I hope he is able to go and do that. Longs Longs is a, is kind of a tough one. I know <laughs> it's a great one though, and and just stunning. And like I said, any opportunity. There's a it's a beautiful quote by a Norwegian philosopher Arne Ness. I, I taught him a lot in my environmental philosophy courses that I taught as a as a university professor, and I've always had it hanging over my desk, whether it be here at my house or in my office at the university that I used to have before I retired, um, that it says, the smaller we come to feel ourselves compared to the mountain, the closer we come to participating in its greatness. And that quote sort of sums it all up for me of why, why go high in elevation, why be among the mountaintops. And it's about humility. It's about participating in something greater than yourself. And it's about humility. And if you can tap into that, I think that honestly, it's life changing. I think that's right. And that's what I was going to say earlier when you were talking about being high up in the mountains in nature is it makes me feel small, but not small, like in a diminutive way or a bad way, but more like we are so small compared to the world. And there are so many different things happening. And it gives me perspective that, okay, some of these little things that I'm worrying about really aren't a big deal in the scale of all yeah. of this. And so I think, and yeah, he's super excited. We're going to have a guide go with them and all that, just because it is a harder mountain. And I was like, I, I am not where I could probably be doing a 14er at this point. I mean, maybe someday, but Long's is kind of hard. And I, so I'm fingers crossed that it all goes well. Yeah, I'm sure he'll, he'll do great. Yeah, I'm sure he'll do great. And in that way, he joins this long tradition of Colorado mountaineering. I, anytime I'm, I'm on a mountain, I, I feel that long legacy, that long tradition of people who just deeply love to, to climb mountains. My brother is one of those. He's finished all 54 of the, all, all of the Colorado 14ers. He's done them all. And again, in a very deeply sort of respectful, spiritual sort of way. And um, I admire that legacy. So I'm, I'm glad your son gets to, to do that. It's a real Colorado experience for sure. <laughs> it really is. And it's something that people talk so much about when you're there and you see all of the signs about the 14ers, but I can't believe your brother's done all 54. That's incredible. Yeah. Yeah. And some people say 56. There are a couple that measure in a strange way, but anyway, historically, the Colorado Mountain Club historically has always said 54, but yeah. In fact, I had the great pleasure of taking him up his very first one, his very first 14er, um, after I had climbed a handful I don't know. I was maybe in college and he was maybe in high school. I'm not sure. I took him up his first first one and he finished him before I did. <laughs> That's okay. He's quite an athlete. But you got him started. <laughs> yeah, I did. 
Well, how did you decide to have Victoria tell the story? Oh, you know, that was never a question. Isn't that interesting? Sometimes when I sit down to write, point of view baffles me a little bit. I've been struggling with that a little bit lately with what I'm writing now. And but with Victoria, her voice, who she is, her voice, it was never a question for me. Once I started getting to know her and her voice was sort of coming through me and I was writing, it was in first person all the way. There was no question about it. I think that makes sense based on her story, but I was just curious if that was something you'd gone back and forth on or if you literally just started from the beginning. And it sounds like you did from the beginning. Yeah, the challenge became how to represent Inga's voice in in a distinct way. They come from very different backgrounds, but they um, have, um, they're of a similar age. They're sort of a similar sort of depth of heart. They have a similar little bit of a tiny bit of a similar experience in the important parts that I'm talking about with Inga's story. And so I played with her a little bit more about first person narrative or not, but And I struggled even how to incorporate Inga's story into the larger story to make sure that the focus stayed clearly. This is Victoria's story, but no spoilers, but Inga's Inga's story ends up becoming an important part of of Victoria understanding her own story. And and all of that was challenging for me, both structurally and narratively to work in there. But I think in the end, it it works. (laughs) It does. And I don't want to have any spoilers either. And I feel like there's so much of your book that is so beautiful. And I don't want to give any of it away so that people can sit down and read with me not having ruined anything. So all I'll say regarding Inga is that I liked the way you did that. I was actually looking back through the book before we talked and I was like, oh, you know, that is a really great way to have her story on the page. So when people read, they can then understand what we're talking about. Well, thank you. That's very validating because I did struggle with it. There were certain things, like I said, I I struggled a little bit with as respectfully as possible representing Will's character. I struggled a little bit with how to get Inga's narrative in there. There were certain things that were more challenging to me about writing this than others and other things that really, really flowed so naturally, which was the descriptions of the natural world, Victoria's evolution while she's out in the natural world, and then just sort of Victoria's voice itself. Well, you did quite well. (laughs) <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> what was the highlight of writing Go as a River? The highlight of writing Go as a River. Oh, Lord. Like I said, I've lived with Victoria a really long time. And this book, I chipped away at it for well over a decade. So I would certainly say that it would have to be finishing it. <laughs> but <laughs> there were certain moments in my life I was not so sure I would ever finish it. But what's kind of funny is my kids and my husband will tease me. We, we had to put the like finger quotes, the air quotes around finish because I've sort of finished this novel multiple times <laughs> where I'm like, we'll have a toast. We, I finished my novel. And then I'm back and I'm tweaking on it and I'm working on it again. They're like, I thought you finished it. I'm like, oh, and maybe it'll never be finished. But gratefully, I have a wonderful, wonderful agent, Sandra Bond, who um, once this novel was in her hands, she was so determined to place it with absolutely the correct editor and publishing house. And that played out to be very true. Um, Once I was working with Spiegel and Grau and working directly with Cindy Spiegel, she and I, the version of the novel that she received, you know, she worked with me to do some revisions and then just sort of sent me off to do them. And when I did them, I really felt like, okay, this is it. This This is the best I've got. Not a lot of of change, but definitely a little bit of restructuring. And honestly, I turned it back into her going, this is the best I've got. And thankfully, she loved it. And that's when I knew it was finally finished. So hallelujah. (laughs) And your husband and kids are like, is it really finished this time? (laughs) Right. Well, I just got back. I had an event. I've just started to do some author events. My full book tour starts on... uh, with a celebration here in the Gunnison Valley on February 27th. And then the book is released on the 28th. And then I'm off for sort of a regional book tour, which is all on my website at shellyreed.com. If people are interested, if they want to catch any of my author events. But I just got back from a lovely two days in San Francisco and Los Angeles with my whole publishing team with Cindy Spiegel and Julie Grau and Nicole Dewey, my publicist, and Liza Wachter. And I got to actually hold and hug the absolute final hardback version of my book for the very first time. 
Oh, I just love that. And that had to just be so gratifying to just literally put your hands on it. Oh my gosh. Honestly, I, I guess I I guess I won't say that I never thought that day would come because I was pretty darn determined that I was gonna finish this, but holding it in my arms was a moving moment. I, I actually just posted it on Instagram today. So and I think Nicole caught it on video. But yeah, to actually hold it in my hands and hug it and know that it's truly really in the world. I, I don't have to use air quotes around finished anymore. It's a real thing. But yeah, it's it's really a dream come true. It's extraordinary. Well, and I know Spiegel and Grau are thrilled because I've seen you speak and seen Cindy speak on several events. I'm sure they're just so pleased too, because this book is so wonderful and is receiving so much great press. They seem to be, yeah, which I'm really grateful that it's looking like it'll be a, a real success for them because they're incredible and they've given me just extraordinary support. So it's really, I think everybody's happy all around. <laughs> and it's nice because with it being an independent publishing house like it is and everybody being so frustrated with the continued consolidation of the larger houses, you really want to see these smaller places do really well. Yeah. And I am super supportive of anything independent, independent publishers, independent booksellers. I just love that those are, you know, more grassroots organizations, people just, you know, just a different feel in, in a lot of ways than some of the larger corporate structures. And so it was a dream for me to be with an independent publishing house. But along with that came all of the decades of expertise that Cindy Spiegel and Julie Grau had developed within the corporate structure. So it really, for me, was the, the best of all possible worlds. Absolutely. They definitely know what they're doing and they're picking high quality books. So it isn't like it's just some small publisher that is just beginning. They definitely have so much experience. But like you said, it's just nice to see some of these indie entities doing well. Yeah, really nice. It's beautiful, really. Well, and you mentioned holding your book and hugging it. So let's talk about the cover because I'm always fascinated with how covers come about. And I think the cover that I have on my galley is different than the cover that is on the final book. Is that right? It is. It is. And having never published a book before, I was really ignorant, I guess, of so much of the process of publishing. You know, I've been a book person my entire life in one way or the other, either as a student, as a professor, as an avid reader, whatever it is. And I love, love, love bookshops. But to me, books just sort of, I know, I know it's difficult to write them, but beyond that, books just sort of magically appeared on the shelf. And, you know, I'm a big fan of saying it takes a village to raise a child because I've had a wonderful village around my ability to raise my kids. But what I have learned is it also takes a village to publish a book. And one of the, the complexities is choosing the right cover. And so it was quite a journey. You know, a lot of it for me was just sort of sitting, I made some suggestions, but mostly I was sitting back and sort of letting the people who have expertise in this area decide what was going to be best for this particular story. And yeah, the galley copy that you have, I'm sure some people have seen that visual where it's a hand, a photograph of a hand holding out a peach. That is the cover that Spiegel and Grau chose initially. And then at some point they, they just, I'm not sure, rethought and thought this would be a little bit more striking, which I think it is. It's a very striking cover. All along, they wanted to highlight the peaches, which I guess we haven't talked very much about, but it, part of the setting, the town of Iola, is Victoria Nash is raised on her family's ancestral peach farm. And then eventually the narrative moves uh, up and over the mountains between here, the Gunnison Valley and the North Fork River Valley into the small town of Paonia, which I love so much, which truly is the North Fork River Valley and the Grand Valley are true Colorado peach country. I took creative license in putting a peach farm in Iola. There's no evidence that there ever was a peach farm in Iola, but I, I interviewed a lot, of, a lot of peach farmers when I was doing the research for this book. And I asked them, but would it be possible? And they were like, yeah, with the right care. But um, the peaches really emerged for Spiegel and Grau and their team as, as what they wanted to feature on the cover. Whereas, I don't know if you've seen the UK cover, but they very much went for a very sort of cinematic look with a big river right on the cover. And so, yeah, you know, it's mysterious to me, knowing that this book is coming out now in more than 30 countries, each one of those countries can choose the Spiegel and Grau cover, 
They can go with the UK cover or they can suggest one of their own. Like Canada has a very, very different cover than the other two. So it'll be fascinating for me to see all the different covers from all the different countries. Like what a joy. (laughs) That is something that authors frequently comment on. And I have seen the Canadian cover, but I don't think I've seen the UK cover. So I'm going to need to go look that up. But what I love about both the galley cover, and then I think that the final one is even more striking, I do agree with you, is it is so representative of the book, but it is also different, which in a, in a great way. Like I am kind of tired of these covers that are all very similar. And so it's this stunning cover, but it's unique. And so you just know it's your book and it's going in a different path. And all the way around, I just thought it was perfect. Oh, I'm so glad to hear that. I really am. The jacket design was by Strick and Williams. And I I think they, from what little I know of them, but working with them was a joy. And I think they're pretty brilliant. Yeah. (laughs) Well, it's tough. And I know that there are trends and a sales department wants certain things to happen with certain covers and all of that. But sometimes I'm like, oh, I just wish some of these were a little more unique. So I'm always really happy when there's something different in a good way. Oh, great, great. Well, I've been imagining, you know, walking into a bookshop and seeing this for, well, years and years and years, well before I ever knew what the cover would be. And then I started imagining the, the, the first cover. But now when I think about walking into a bookshop and seeing this cover, oh, I just, I think it's going to be incredible. <laughs> Me too. It's just beautiful. And I'd like to quickly talk about the title, Go is a River, and I know you incorporate that into the book, which I loved as well, but talk a little bit about how you landed on that as the title. Yeah, I will. Titles for me are difficult. I write write some for magazines, and I've written short fiction historically. Titles are always such a difficult thing for me. And I actually, in the various revisions of this book, I played with lots of different titles. But Go is a River, once once I started conceptualizing that, I thought, oh, okay, this is, this is just right. A few things about, about the, the title. The, the exact wording of it, I have a tremendous amount of respect for the Vietnamese Buddhist monk. His name is Thich Nhat Hanh. And Thich Nhat Hanh, I've studied his teachings for decades. And one of the lessons that he often teaches is the more that we can think of ourselves as a drop of water in a river, the more that we can look to a river for guidance for our existence, that there's a lot of wisdom and a lot of lessons to be learned there. And uh, he has a fairly famous, he was, his calligraphy paintings are very famous. He, uh, they're beautiful and he has hundreds of them. One of them says, go as a river. And it, it's taken from some of his other teaching that talks a little bit about the power of rivers in our lives. And then also um, the Native American traditions that I've taught a lot in my environmental philosophy classes and have read a lot of about and I've spent as much time as I, I can on various Native American reservations, getting to know that wisdom and the concept of living one's life as a river is, is very deeply embedded in many of those indigenous cultures as well. And so it's sort of an, a quiet sort of thematic thread that flows beneath this entire story. And yes, I do have Will say that to Victoria fairly early on in the book. And then later in the book, one of Victoria's sort of cathartic moments towards the end of the book is she sort of says, I finally understand what this means. And so, yeah, I'm, I'm really grateful for the title. I, I hope it gives people pause and something deeper to think about of how our lives evolve and flow. I think so, definitely. Well, before we wrap up, I would love to hear what you've read recently that you really liked. Well, you know, it's always hard for me a little bit when I'm really deep in writing something. I don't read a lot. I get so involved in my own story that I don't want someone else's story to get too mixed up in my head. And so I will have to say that I haven't been reading a lot lately. I am trying to work on a a second novel, but I have to say that any time that I can say how much Marilyn Robinson's books have affected me in my life, I just, I love her with my whole heart. I think she's a genius. I don't know that her novels are for everyone in that they're very quiet and they're very wise and they're very character driven. But if that's something that you like, I would highly recommend any of Marilyn Robinson's books. 
And I read them and reread them and reread them and reread them. And I just always find something new to discover in them. And I also read a lot of poetry. I read really anytime I have writer's block, I sit down and read poetry. I read poetry maybe more than anything else. And I, that has always been true for me ever since I was in college. You know, I, I can always reach for Mary Oliver. Anyone who loves the nature writing in my book, I would really recommend the poetry of Mary Oliver. I just recently bought a new collected works of, of Lucille Clifton. I just, I can't even begin. Rilke, I turn to a lot. I can't even begin to list the poets that, that I feel like are family to me. I love them so much. And I'm also a huge fan of Terry Tempest Williams. Anything that Terry Tempest Williams write, she's such, right, she's such a champion for the natural world. And I would really always highly recommend her books as well. Okay, I'm not familiar with her. She is a similar history in Utah as I do in Colorado. She's a generational Utah. I don't know how to say it. Utahian. <laughs> She's <laughs> her, her family's been in Utah for generations and generations. I've never actually met her, but I've admired her work and loved her as a as an environmental activist um, for decades. And she's deeply, deeply, deeply rooted to the land, Salt Lake area of Utah, but also a champion for wild landscapes in the canyon country of Utah, which also means so much to me. I'm really the happiest if I'm on the highest, highest peak or the deepest, deepest canyon. And the wild areas of, of the Utah canyon country really needs voices of support and defense. And she's been a great one. Her book, Refuge. I would recommend to anyone who loves birds and anybody who likes to attend carefully to the natural world. It's, it's glorious. Okay, I'm going to add that one to my list. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Well, Shelley, thank you so much for coming on the Thoughts from a Page podcast. I just loved your book so very much, and I can't wait for it to get out into the world. Oh, well, bless you. I, I appreciate your support so much. I know a lot of people are reading my book because you have recommended it, and I could just can never thank you enough for that. Well, absolutely. I can't thank you enough for writing it. Thank you so much, Cindy. You might be surprised to know that not all serial killers are straight cisgender white men, and the victims of true crime are not a monolith either. She's Wendy and I'm Beth, and together we host Fruit Loop Serial Killers of Color, a true crime podcast. Together we take deep dives into the true crime stories about marginalized and minoritized perps and victims that often go untold. We also provide the context and nuance that these stories deserve. At Fruit Loops, we're serving up true crime with a side of history, society, culture, and some fun. Listen to Fruit Loop Serial Killers of Color on Spotify, Google Play, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. Thank you so much for listening to my podcast. If you liked this episode, and I hope you did, please follow me on Instagram at Thoughts from a Page. Consider joining my Patreon group to access bonus content and support the podcast. Tell all of your friends about the show and rate it or subscribe to it wherever you listen to your podcasts. I would really appreciate it. The book discussed in this episode can be purchased at my bookshop storefront, and the link is in the show notes. I hope you'll tune in next time. Are you tired of seeing your teen or young adult struggle on a path that clearly isn't the right fit? Is your teenager confused about which direction to take after high school? The future of work is changing rapidly, and our kids need to know all of the options available after high school so they're empowered to make the choice that is best for them. In each episode, we explore the latest trends that are shaping the opportunities of today and tomorrow. I'm your host, Betsy Jewell, and this is the High School Hamster Wheel Podcast.